is a report that's part of a series of reports we've been working on for the last couple of years that's been funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. So we want to thank them for their support. Uh, and this was a series that we've undertaken to examine international IT application leadership. In other words, look around the world at a wide variety of IT applications that are powering uh, growth or innovation and trying to understand who's in the lead and why. So we've looked at uh, mobile payments, uh, we've looked at intelligent transportation systems, and we've looked at health IT. Uh, this is the fourth in that series, looking at um, uh, IP IDs. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to introduce our speakers. Uh, I'll just make a few quick remarks. I'm going to turn it over to Daniel to moderate the discussion because I have to fortunately meet for a different meeting. Uh, so I remember back in 19, I guess 2000, for those of you who remember back then in the Clinton administration, there was a bill that Congress passed, actually there was a bill that Utah passed initially in the first state of the country to pass a digital signature bill. And the idea was to, uh, as, as the internet was emerging, people felt we needed to be able to have a legal standing for digital signature signature that could be conducted online. And so Utah passed a bill. A couple other states were thinking about it, and Congress decided that they were going to pass a bill uh, to create a national framework. And at the time, uh, a lot of people were anticipating and, and even expecting that within just a couple of years, there would be this blossoming of uh, digital signatures and e-identity. Uh, and um, I hate to say that this, but I said at the time, no, we wouldn't get this uh, because there was this fundamental chicken or egg problem with these technologies that just the fact that you have a legal recognition of this doesn't mean you're going to get it because you have to have people who accept EIDs, whether they're for authentication or whether they're for signature capabilities. Uh, and if no one's accepting them, why would you get one? And if no one has them, why would you accept them? And so you have that chicken or egg problem. And that's really uh, what we want to talk today about uh, and looking at other countries. Other countries, including Estonia, who we're really pleased to have a, a, a colleague from Estonia one of the, the world leaders of this, they've been able to figure out this chicken or egg problem uh, through smart public-private partnerships and have been able to, uh, to really move forward. Uh, last thing I'll say is, um, <coughs> you know, it's interesting to me, it, it, it's to me a, a little bit of a reflection of, uh, I pre really appreciate all of you who came today, but to me it's a reflection, if we had done this uh, and, and we did a report, I guarantee this would be the case, if we did a report called uh, uh, Cloud computing driver of, evolu of, of revolution and all, particularly in social networking and peer-to-peer uh, -peer technology, we'd have a full house. Uh, especially if we put Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube in the in it somehow, because uh, those are cool. Everybody gets it. The press gets it. This is just as important, if not more important, to the evolution of our emerging digital economy. And. I think one of the reasons we're trying to, we're saying that, one of the reasons we're in the court is to make that much more clear to Washington policymakers. This is critical. And even though it's not Facebook, even though it's not Twitter, uh, even though it's not cloud, it's really important that we get this right. So with that, let me start by introducing our, our panelists today. Uh, Daniel Castro uh, will lead off as a senior analyst at ITIF. He specializes in, and focuses on uh, really all the work we do in IT, whether that's health IT or data privacy, electronic voting, information security, et cetera. Before coming to ITIF, he was an IT analyst at GAO, uh, and uh, he has a, uh, he's also a, he's a visiting scientist at the Software Engineering Institute in Pittsburgh, and has an MS in uh, information security technology from Carnegie Mellon. My longtime colleague and friend, Jeremy Grant, it's good to see you. Good to be here. Jeremy and I have been hanging out and doing this for, geez, I think 12 years now or something like that. So, uh, at least. At least. <laughs> so uh, a soldier in the trenches. Uh, Jeremy is a senior executive advisor for identity management at NIST. Uh, he joined NIST uh, just earlier this year to manage the National Program Office for the National Strategy of Trusted Identities in Cyberspace. I uh, actually was remiss in pointing out, I know Daniel, well, the administration, the Obama administration recently released a report, a strategy moving forward on that, which we uh, uh, highly commend them for, and, and, and Jeremy can talk a, a little bit about that. Uh, prior to um, uh, coming here, he was legislative aide in the U.S. Senate, uh, where he worked on the CAC card and the GSA smart card efforts. 
He then was with Maximus, which is a, a, a contracting company, and worked in the security and IT management division. Uh, so really has a long, long, distinguished background in, in this area. Um, and next to Jeremy's Aaron uh, uh, Brower uh, Ricky, who was a Ron Plesser Fellow at the Center for Democracy and Technology. Prior to joining CDT, Aaron worked as a law clerk at Whale, Gospel, and, Ma and Mange, uh, where he focused on patent and digital media litigation. He earned his JD at UC Berkeley School of Law. He served as the senior online editor of the California Law Review and the editor of the Berkeley Technology Journal. And then, as I mentioned, we're joined by the magic of Skype, uh, which is appropriate that we have a colleague from Estonia since Skype was invented by an Estonian uh, computer scientist. Uh, Heller Lasik, who is the chief expert in Estonian Police and Border Guard uh, Board. Uh, he served as the project manager for the first e-passport system in Estonia. He's become an expert in e-passports. He's currently working on the development and design process for the next generation of the Estonian EID card. Uh, he graduated from Tallinn Technical University with a degree in radio engineering, uh, then joined the Hi-Fi Audio Equipment R&D Enterprise, Punain R&RET, um, and um, so he has been leading uh, many of the Estonian efforts. And as you'll hear, Estonia is really is one of the world leaders in this space. Uh, I, I recently had dinner with the president of Estonia uh, when he was in town six eight weeks ago, and uh, I'll tell you, it was very impressive. Uh, this is all goes all the way to the top of the country. A committed leadership of the country to really drive digital transformation and leadership in Estonia. So we're really pleased uh, that you can join us. So I'll turn it over to Daniel and get us off. Get us off. Thanks, Rob, and I uh, appreciate everyone coming out today. As Rob mentioned, this is um, probably one of you know the most important things. Uh, this is one of you know the most exciting developments for um, you know, the information economy and, and what we're doing online, and it hasn't received nearly the amount of attention that it, it should have and will hopefully receive in the future. Uh, this report that we have, uh, we have a slide there. So this report, as you saw, it's, it's fairly large, it's fairly comprehensive, it, it covers a lot. Um, so what I wanted to do today is focus really on a few smaller um, issues. Is this my copy of So three questions um, that we want to go through today. You know, one, what is an electronic ID? Um, why do we care about this? What are the benefits in this area? How does it help consumers? Um, how are IDs being used in other countries? What can we um, see all these other different countries doing um, over the last decade or so? What lessons can we learn from these countries? And then really, the question that we're really concerned about today is, what can the US learn from all these early adopters? Um, you know, we have a great strategy that just came out we have a huge opportunity right now um, to really move forward with this uh, technology, uh, but there's a lot that we can learn uh, before we do that. So I think to, to really understand what an electronic ID is, first you have to understand the problem it's trying to solve, and I think that problem is uh, you know, best illustrated with this cartoon that is you know, very famous for The New Yorker. On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, right? So you know, the internet's famous for um, you know, having this you know, so-called anonymity online, which is you know, great for um, you know, democracy and conversation and, and lots of other things you do. But sometimes you want someone to know that you're a dog. And sometimes you want to um, not just tell them you're a dog, but have it be something that's legal and provable. Um, and something that you can sign your name to a document that says, yes, I'm a dog. This is my identity. And that's something we can't do online right now. Um, it's actually something that's very powerful. There's a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of services. There's a lot of... Um, products out there that we can't uh, fully do online, we can't fully embrace digital technology online without this ability. And that's what electronic IDs are trying to solve. 
Um, you know, we have a formal definition in the report of an electronic ID system. Uh, you know, we call it a system of technologies and processes um, that enable individuals to electronically prove their identity or an aspect of their identity to an information system. So it's really the idea of being able to communicate your identity over distance. And you know, the idea here is that we can you know, replace the hodgepodge collection of online identities that everyone has, uh, which is mostly usernames and passwords uh, that aren't very secure, um, that aren't authoritative about who we are, and replace it with something that's uh, simple, simpler, more secure, and universally accepted. And the two main functions of electronic ID, um, as, as Rob alluded to, are being able to sign a document electronically, sign an electronic message, and being able to authenticate to an online service. And these two kind of basic principles are what we use to build up the entire identity ecosystem. So what our report does is really focus on national level electronic ID systems. We don't look at um, smaller regional systems or expect uh, sector specific systems. We're really looking at how can this be deployed on a national level? Well, what are countries doing at a national level? Um, and then we're also not looking at um, ID systems that are being deployed just for a single purpose. So an e-passport, for example, is kind of a, you know electronic identity in some sense, but it's really only used for border control. It doesn't have this kind of broader application to the public sector, the private sector. So that's kind of how we scope out the report. Um, you know, kind of going with the definition of what electronic ID is, um, I think when you talk to, especially when you talk to reporters, they say, well, you know, what is it? Can, is it something I can hold? Is it a card? A lot of Europeans, of course, are using identity cards, and electronic ID for them is the evolution of the national ID card that's existed before. But um, really, an electronic ID is a concept. Um, it's a collection of technologies. It's you know, part of a set of processes and policies uh, and legal frameworks that allow an identity ecosystem to evolve and operate. So it can be a card, it can be a um, software-based digital certificate with a PIN number and a password. Uh, it can be something on your mobile phone. It can be a SIM card. Uh, it can be an RSA token. It's anything that's an electronic identifier that can be made secure, that can be tied to someone's identity, and then that can be used to prove your identity to someone else. And of course, um, out of that comes all these different benefits, all these different uh, possibilities for how we can use electronic IDs to, um, to help consumers, uh, help businesses, and, and make government work better. Uh, the primary benefit for consumers is, of course, enhancing privacy and security for the consumer. Uh, security here is talking about you know, reducing fraud, reducing uh, identity theft, eliminating stolen passwords, and this is a, a major opportunity. If you look at ID theft last year, it was $38 billion in the United States, the cost to Americans, it affected over uh, 8 million Americans in the United States. Last spring, you know, we saw the, the case with um, Sony where uh, they were hacked and we had hundreds of thousands of uh, usernames and passwords publicly re released on the internet. Uh, we have a major security problem online and this is a um, huge opportunity to fix it here. Uh, one of the ways that electronic IDs really improve uh, the situation is that it, it changes uh, you know, the current system of where we have lots of different passwords that generally aren't very secure. You know, people are using uh, dictionary words, they're using you know, the word password instead of their password. Right? And you replace that with something much better. You can use biometrics, you use multi-factor authentication, um, and you create a much more secure uh, authentication environment. Electronic IDs, of course, are also um, used very much to enhance privacy. It's a privacy enhancing technology. And the classic example of this is uh, the comparison to when you go to a liquor store. Uh, you go to a liquor store and somebody says, you know, are you 21? You have to prove that you're 21 to um, buy alcohol. So what do you do? You hand someone a driver's license. Of course, your driver's license doesn't just say that you're over the age of 21. It has your name, it has your address, it has your uh, you know, full date of birth, it has your blood type, you know, all this other information that's on your driver's license. What an electronic ID does is it really changes the equation. It changes how you interact with different types of service providers. So if somebody asks you, are you over 21, you can answer yes. You don't have to say how old you are. You don't have to say what your name is. You can just say yes, and you can say yes in a provable, secure way. And that's very powerful, and that's a concept that can be extended to the entire identity ecosystem. The other major benefit for consumers is electronic signatures. It's the ability to sign and execute legally binding documents online. It's the ability to put your name to messages um, in a secure and verifiable way. 
Um, and that's, of course, used, um, you know, signing, this idea of uh, signing is used throughout business and government, um, and it makes business processes work much better. Businesses like electronic IDs and, and can benefit them, of course, because they can better interact with consumers. Um, you can have more personalization, you can improve online trust, you can use single sign-on, so um, the person's interaction online is that much simpler. There's uh, fewer um, prompts for them to log on as they navigate across different sites. And then, of course, the major economic opportunity here is for lots of new products and services. And Electronic ID is really a platform for innovation. Um, there's so many different potential uses from banking to healthcare, and Electronic ID can replace basically everything in your wallet, um, from what you use for banking, for mobile payments, for peer-to-peer -peer payments. Um, it can replace you know, your gym card, loyalty cards, your library card. Um, it really gives uh, consumers the ability to do many more things. They can share documents online securely. Um, you can authenticate to lots of online services. If you think about air travel um, and the progression we've seen in that area, you can see how electronic IDs are really the next step. So if you remember, you know, 20, 15 years ago, um, everyone had paper documents, right? Paper boarding passes. If you had uh, multiple segments, you had you know, a ticket for each segment, it was a big wad of paper, and you couldn't lose it. If you lost it, you know, you were stuck. You couldn't get on your flight. Right, then we moved to electronic tickets. Um, that was, you know, digitizing the, um, digitizing the electronic records, the electronic ticket. So it didn't matter if you had the actual paper ticket, you wanted the digital ticket. And then, of course, now we've moved recently into having mobile check-in. Um, but even now with mobile check-in, right, you still have to have your ID. The idea with electronic IDs is you can combine everything into one device or one token. So with your mobile phone, you can not only check into your flight, um, have your flight there, but you can also use it as your boarding pass and you can use it as your ID. It's the only thing you need. It doesn't have to be a mobile phone, of course. It could be a card or it could be something else. Um, but the idea is that you can centralize everything together in one place. And then, of course, electronic IDs are used for e-government. It's used to make e-government work better uh, for consumers, be more efficient, uh, be more productive. Consumers can use it to do anything from filing taxes to signing electronic documents to uh, enrolling in services. Um, and then, of course, there's lots of new and interesting services that are being offered by government in, in many countries, as we'll see. What the report does is it, it tries to take a snapshot of where we are um, and where other countries are right now with electronic IDs. Uh, it's a very fast-moving environment right now. Um, a lot of countries have been doing this for a long time. Some countries have been doing this for a few years. So, you know, the day that um, I, would, I would caution, it, it changes quickly, but when you take a snapshot, I think you can see a few um, trends emerge, and one of the trends is this kind of breakdown between deployment and use. Um, so what we've done is we've broken down countries into um, high deployment, high use, low deployment, low use, and uh, no use and no deployment. And you can, of course, see that the large contrast between, you know, Estonia, which is pretty much the clear leader in this area, and in other countries which have been successful um, in various aspects of this. They've either been successful in um, rolling it out universally to a lot of citizens, or they've been successful in getting uh, a small group of citizens more actively involved in using the electronic ID. And of course, you have the United States, uh, bottom right, where we haven't really done anything yet, um, but we have a, a large opportunity to do it. Uh, what's not on the slide um, here, this is mostly uh, European countries, um, have Malaysia up there as well. Um, but I would just note that it, uh, when you look, there are um, other countries outside of Europe that are doing this, especially uh, many countries in the Middle East, um, uh, Qatar, Bahrain, uh, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, lots of countries in that area um, have been investing in electronic IDs and are, are moving uh, quickly in this area. So what I want to do is just highlight a few of the kind of um, more interesting examples and some of the features in some of these countries. Uh, Austria initiated their program in 2001. Um, what's kind of neat about what Austria did is they have their citizen card, their, their burger card, um, and they said it's not going to be an actual card. Uh, they were kind of the first ones to say electronic ID is in a card, it's a concept. And so it can be, uh, the, the citizen card can be deployed on many different types of tokens. It can be deployed on a health insurance card, on a bank card, um, on a student ID card, or on a mobile phone. You had um, Belgium, which started in 2004. They've been one of the most successful in terms of deployment to over 9 million uh, citizens and residents. Uh, 
what they've done is they've uh, been very successful integrating and tying in the electronic ID functionality with e-government services. So they have over 600 services available. Um, you know, if you're online, you want to communicate with your police, local police, you can go and report that somebody's uh, put graffiti on a wall near you or that you've had something stolen. Um, and then, of course, they've also been thinking about new applications. So they're using electronic ID as a ticket, for example, to go to a sporting event or to ride the train. Uh, we have uh, Denmark, uh, which was interesting because they, you know, the Danes are, are very forward thinking. They're, they're really leaders in a lot of the type of innovative technologies that um, we talk about. And they were early here too, but they didn't do anything. So in 1992, they said, um, wouldn't it be great if we had online identities and we had electronic IDs? Then they didn't really do anything for about 10 years um, because they got <coughs> wrapped up in a political debate on it. But then in 2003, they did um, start deploying this. Uh, what's unique about the Danes is they've also used um, primarily a software-based electronic ID um, along with one-time passwords. So actual um, passwords, a little pamphlet or a booklet that's mailed to you with one-time passwords, and you, and you use those passwords and you get a new one in the mail later on. That was kind of their first model. Um, and they've been very successful in using it in certain areas, uh, banking, government, and, and healthcare. And what's also interesting about Denmark is that it was primarily the deployment led by uh, the private sector, in this case, uh, the banks. So we can kind of see this as, um, in various countries, that one industry or one sector is kind of the, the killer app um, to push out deployment. Uh, Estonia, which we'll hear a, a lot more about in a minute, um, started in 2002. They've deployed it pretty much um, across uh, the country to over a million people. And they have lots of different types of uses, um, such as e-banking, signing tax reforms or tax declarations, um, signing documents that you exchange with other individuals, both in government and in the private sector, accessing uh, lots of different types of these services, accessing wireless networks, and of course, most famously, using it for online voting. Uh, they're the pioneers for internet voting, and you know this is one of the really interesting and novel applications of what an electronic ID can do. And then Malaysia, I'll just mention briefly, they started in 1999. They're one of the countries that is also on a second generation of electronic IDs. Not only have they deployed it, they've you know, gone back and, and looked at how they've done it, and they've come up with new standards and, and upgraded and um, are trying to do it even better now. Uh, they've deployed the MyCAD card to over 19 million people. They have a MyKid card, which is for um, children that's deployed. Uh, their card is used for lots of different types of services, not just the traditional um, authentication and signing purposes. So it's used as a bank card, it's used as an ATM card, it's used for transportation on public buses, um, and it's, it's tied to lots of other types of services, including healthcare. So, you know, we look through all this and, um, and we see that other countries have been doing this for over a decade. Um, some countries are on, you know, second generation technology, uh, whereas in the U.S. we're just kind of starting to think about it. Um, but the good news is, one, we have a great uh, draft strategy. Uh, which I think uh, you know, Jeremy will well, get into. Well, it's finals, not a draft. <laughs> or draft, yeah, final, final strategy, um, which is, I think, a, a good working document for how we go forward. It's a great vision. Um, but you know, getting from the vision to where these other countries are is going to take a lot of work. Um, the other good news here, I think, is that we really have the opportunity to leapfrog um, some of these other countries. That you know, these, some countries are, are stuck with kind of older technology and we can be a little more forward thinking. We can learn from their experience in both good and bad and um, hopefully um, you know, do, things, do things better. So we have a number of recommendations in the report. Um, some of these, of course, are um, echoed in, in the NISTIC uh, final, final report, final strategy. Um, the, one of the key ones I think that really comes out uh, when I read it was collaborating with all stakeholders, especially the private sector, um, especially in the United States where you don't have the kind of national government run ID infrastructure um, that you see in a lot of other countries. A lot of other countries have population registers where people are routinely linking their linking and updating their identity information with the government. We don't really have that same type of concept here. There's a lot of resources in the private sector, whether it's Facebook, uh, Microsoft, and Google, who have uh, you know single sign-on uh, that they've used on lots of sites. Whether it's um, Open ID or uh, you know Experian. Uh, that has lots of uh, you know, kind of credit or financial information about people that's used for identity proofing. There's many opportunities here. Um, 
and we can build off of these efforts. And one of the efforts I think is, is most important, it's kind of a, a private public partnership right now, is electronic health records, right? We have a very large investment in um, health IT, and there's a lot of questions that go around with health IT about how do you authenticate the users to these systems? Um, how do you authenticate all the doctors? How do doctors um, prescribe medicine? How do pharmacies know that doctors are licensed? How do patients access their records? How do they um, authorize other people to access their records? These are all identity questions. And this is a, a great opportunity where we're spending lots of money on new technology to say, how can we invest in this technology, not only for the sector, but to um, invest in technology that can be applied across the economy. Uh, a second recommendation here is to support current and emerging technologies. Um, I think this is kind of echoed in what I showed with other countries where we don't want to just pick you know, card technology and say that's the way forward. We really want to have a framework that's flexible, that allows the private sector to pick the type of technology that best suits the problem um, and that can evolve over time. We want government um, to, of course, increase both supply and demand. This is really the chicken or egg problem that Rob mentioned at the beginning. Um, there's a lot the government can do, and they can't just do it on the supply side. Um, the, the countries that took the if we build it, they will come approach um, are those with high deployment, low use. That doesn't really work. Um, but you do need to do both. So on, on the supply side, uh, we have many opportunities. Um, government at the federal level, we have you know, 2 million federal workers and more contractors. Um, that have personal identity verification cards like the DOD CAT card. Um, the idea is once we have a framework in place, let's make sure that these types of cards can not only be used within the public garden of government, but can be used outside in the private sector as well. Uh, you know, we have 8 million state and local employees. As those employees start using, um, you know, ID cards within local, state and local government, let's make sure those can be used outside. This can help kind of bootstrap the system. Uh, we want to make sure the government can be an uh, issuer or uh, ID provider, right? So even if the private sector is offering something, we want to make sure there is a low-cost, um, affordable option for all individuals that want to access um, want to access an electronic ID. So the idea is that we can have. Hellers, we'll mute that. Um, the idea is that we can have you know Department of Homeland Security, or Department of State. They already issue. Um, IDs in the form of uh, travel documents or uh, passports. They have all the necessary processes in place for identity proofing. So can we build off of that and issue electronic IDs? Uh, can state DMVs be involved? Um, many opportunities here. And of course, government isn't just going to be an um, identity provider. They can also be an attribute provider. This is one of the you know, most important parts of uh, the identity ecosystem. It's not just about your identity. It's about all the different aspects or attributes that can be linked to your identity. Uh, so you know, one example of this is the Social Security Administration. Uh, the Social Security Administration, for example, can be an attribute provider to say, you know, if you're um, registered with us for receiving disability benefits, this is an attribute that you can take somewhere else. So you can you know, take this to your local government and get discounts on your transportation. Um, you know, if you're the State Department and you're managing all these vital statistics, you can use it to prove your gender. If you're a public university, you can prove that somebody is a student. Um, these are all those kind of attributes that government can be involved in. And then, of course, on the demand side, there's lots that can be done. Uh, number one is making the ID the default way of interacting with uh, the federal and state and local governments. What we need is really a, a top-down review of what are all the authenticating services that are online and how many of those can be moved over to um, using electronic ID. We also need a review of signing processes. What documents do we still require to be signed in, in, with an ink signature? And how can we make sure all of those processes are also rolled over um, in, in a short period so we can use electronic signatures using electronic ID? Uh, we want to make sure we're maximizing utility for both users and uh, service providers. This really means two things. Um, for both the users and the service providers, you want to have very strong security. What often happens um, in pretty much every country that we've seen is most of the security benefits are really to the service provider. So it's to the government or the private sector. Now that benefits the consumer, of course, because it reduces fraud, it reduces lots of things. But when you're talking about incentivizing adoption, you want the consumer to really benefit. And so German, uh, the Germans have been uh, really created an interesting model here because they created mutual authentication with their EAD system. 
So the idea is that before you send someone else your information, they have to send you theirs. Um, and it's, it's a kind of simple concept, but a lot of countries don't think about that. Um, so what you do is you have all the um, authorized service providers in Germany that they have to receive a certificate that says they're authorized. And with that certificate comes legal responsibilities of how they handle data. And so before you send data to someone else, they know, you know as an individual, that this is one, um, this person has been certified by the government, and two, uh, it's a specific identity. So if I'm sending uh, my information to a bank, I know that's actually my bank and it's not an imposter. And that's, uh, that's kind of a very powerful way of um, adding value to users and to the user experience. Another idea we have up here is, um, it's kind of a simple thing, but make sure we're not eliminating information from the information economy. Uh, I talked earlier about all the privacy benefits um, that electronic IDs offer. So, you know, the idea here is there's a lot of information that we don't necessarily need to exchange, but we are making it um, available in useful ways for, for research or to improve business processes. So part of the, the national strategy, I think, should be not only looking at how can we ensure privacy, but how can we make sure that we still have beneficial uses of sharing information. Uh, we need to make sure we're not just uh, eliminating data that was actually helpful to consumers and beneficial to consumers in the long term. Uh, we want to strive for disruptive innovation, uh, not just incremental innovation. It's, it's common, and I think what we see in a lot of countries is that electronic IDs were kind of the next step, and so they've gone very slowly. Um, but really, electronic IDs, especially in the United States, where we don't have anything like this, it gives an opportunity not only in business but in government to really be very innovative and think about new ways of doing business. So one example um, that we could steal from the Belgium is this idea of having an ask-once policy for government. Um, in Belgium, if you share information with the government, you're only supposed to do that once. Um, there's one government agency that you tell your you know, financial information to for your filing, and that's it. So then if you're applying for a student loan, for example, you don't have to go and repeat all that information. There's these linkages within government that makes government more efficient and it makes it more citizen friendly. Um, finally, uh, or, or second, we have um, make electronic IDs uh, more accessible and available to individuals. I think this is a, a concept that many people relate to. We have um, talked, of course, for the last probably two decades about a digital divide uh, in the country, and there's been many efforts to close those divides. Um, in the past, other people have talked about an ID divide that exists today, just in terms of analog identity. Uh, so as we move to electronic IDs, and as this becomes a very um, integral part of, of society, uh, we want to make sure that it's available and accessible to all individuals. This means um, any group that could be marginalized, whether it's people with disabilities, low-income groups, or even foreign residents. Um, you know, one thing that we've seen in uh, some other countries is that after they move to electronic IDs, it's very hard to do banking if you're just a, even a legal foreign resident. Uh, in, in one of these countries. So you need to make sure there's not groups that are marginalized in the process. Uh, and finally, we have, you know, make sure we're designing an electronic ID system for the global economy. Um, digital economy is obviously global, and we need systems in place that are they're global as well. And the U.S. can really be a leader in this area um, as, we, as we roll this out, because no other country has, has really been successful in making their electronic IDs operable outside their borders. Um, there's some efforts at, at the European level, um, but they haven't been uh, very successful on, on a large scale. And as, as we get involved in this area, uh, it's obviously very critical that we make sure that you know, the internet stays global um, and that the online services stay global. And one way to do that is making sure electronic IDs function across, uh, across national boundaries. There's a lot more in the report, of course, uh, but I want to stop there and we'll turn it over to Heller, he'll give us an introduction, an overview of some of the latest from Estonia, and then we'll have Jeremy uh, jump in here and tell us all about uh, this. Thank you. Heller, if you can hear us, uh, you're going to be up on the screen in just one second, so you can go ahead and begin. Uh. Uh, it was very heartwarming to listen to all those fine words from Daniel Shastra. Uh, he contacted me several weeks ago and asked me to have a speech at your panel. Now I'm here. Uh, 
it's a fascinating how this uh, homework has been done on such a very, very high level. So there is maybe nothing I could uh, add to it, but I will at least try. <clears throat> we can do various things online. We can uh, do banking uh, with uh, password codes. We can send emails to government services. We can pay for the parking with a mobile phone or some other goods. So why do you need an ID card and digital signature? Uh, it's a comfortable photo format. You can put it into your wallet. It's a state-of-the-art security level. It expands the function of documents. Digital and electronic identification, travel documents, enables the use of new technologies, enables the use of e-government and e-business service. In Estonia, uh, the preparations for the electronic ID card started in 1997 already. And there are two uh, brown uh, legal acts that make all this possible. One is the Personal Identity Documents Act, that was introduced in February 1999, and the digital signature in March 2000. Uh, this uh, signature act uh, made it possible, uh, all this uh, electronic signature uh, system, because it made it level uh, written signature with e-signature. So, the initiative group of the project was formed in the Ministry of the Interior in November 1999 and government accepted the plan for launching the ID card in May 2000. The tender for the personalization of identity cards was won by Trubak in Switzerland. The first card was issued on January 28, 2002 and the first legal digital signature was given in October 2002. Uh, on September 12th this year, we had 1,163,917 valid ID cards. Uh, during the last election, 25% of all the votes given were given by uh, electronic means. We have e voting. Uh, 104 million persons have digitally identified themselves altogether 14 million 500,000 times. It means that they are counting together all the instances. And although we have 20, uh, 62 million digital signatures given, uh, we have e ID functionality in uh, ID cards. We call it the uh, identity document or personal document. Then we have the same functionality in uh, residence card. That's uh, the new EU document. And we have also digital ID card, but uh, uh, this is substitute of the identity card and mobile ID. Uh, the ID card is mandatory. Uh, nobody punish the holder if uh, he or she doesn't have it. We have other means uh, like uh, the limits of the bank uh, transfer and uh, limited services that uh, the e-card users can have and so on. And I mentioned this uh, digital ID. Uh, it's a substitute document uh, that can be issued uh, while waiting because the ordinary ID card a person should uh, wait uh, due to logistical problems uh, about one week. But uh, as very much depends on ID cards in Estonia again already, so uh, we had to find the solution how to uh, just help people to go on with their electronic life and uh, start to issue digital ID card. This ID card doesn't bear the name, uh, face of the holder, but um, it can be used uh, absolutely the same way as a normal ID card in, uh, over the internet. <coughs> and mobile ID, that's the functionality of a special SIM card that 
the, will be obtained from the mobile service provider and it also has the same functionality uh, on the service level and it has also government support starting from uh, uh, spring this year. What we have understood that uh, is the key principle, keep it simple and stupid. There are two ways of uh, ID cards uh, to implement. One is to uh, create the electronic wallet. Uh, you have all the features together and you need very much amount of memory on the card. And uh, so the functionality is uh, quite limited. The other way is as our to keep the information uh, on the card uh, quite few and rely on uh, various uh, online services. Uh, we don't have health data recorded, there are no bank access data, no social security data, no wallet functionality, no driver's license functionality, and uh, there are many, many notes. Inside the card, there's a crypto chip and two <coughs> certificates. One is the authentication certificate the, for uh, the person and the, uh, to identify uh, as the service provider and the other is the signature certificate. Uh, for an ID card and for a residence card uh, with the e-government functionality is eligible a student citizen, then alien citizen having long-term residence permit EU citizen, citizen family member, and third country citizen having a valid residence uh, So, as I mentioned already, we have a few certificates on the card, and also a personal information file containing uh, all the visual data that uh, printed on the card. Of course, it's laser engraved uh, in our case. Uh, so, uh, the ID card is useful for only two things, to authenticate the person, so to get access to the service, and to sign electronically, in the local computer, in the distant location, or the LAN or in. That's all, just a key. And as the uh, interface uh, specifications are free to every uh, service provider who wants to uh, give access uh, to his or her services, over the internet uh, can have the specification, can create and develop the service and move on, join the community. Uh, all the software uh, can be, uh, for the ID card usage, can be downloaded over the internet, installed in the computer by the user himself. Uh, of course, uh, a card reader to be bought but uh, there are quite many models uh, available on the market, so everyone can choose uh, what uh, suits for him. So, we can use ID cards in public sector, in tax and customs, e-elections, state registers, ID tickets, e-schools, e-health, in private sector banking, communication service providers, community service providers, and so on. But uh, digital signature is just a technology, more needed. Like a wheel is technology. For driving, you need a car, road. You don't uh, get along with only having uh, one wheel. So you have to have internet penetration, public key infrastructure, governmental data exchange layer. We have uh, such a um, so-called meeting place where all governmental registers and services get together and over this uh, layer, then the service, access to the service, or mental services can be um, given. And also third service, uh, banks, uh, like I told already. Uh, we have internet penetration uh, somewhere uh, 75, 80 percent, maybe it has uh, changed lately, I'm not aware of, uh, but over half of the families a broadband connection, and uh, almost all schools are connected to broadband internet. And mobile penetration is uh, almost uh, one and a half hundred percent of the population.
the uh, ESRO gives access to various uh, services for the citizen, for entrepreneur, civil servant, state port of services, registered services, access to other infrastructure. Uh, like electronic health records, all information on patients' exams and consultations are available from one location. The, the doctor uh, just logs into the uh, portal and uh, give, gets access from information uh, about uh, previous uh, health uh, problems, uh, illnesses, and so on, can add information there. Uh, the patient can restrict access to different parts of the record. So uh, some uh, doctors uh, get information about some uh, diseases, some are not. It depends on the patient. And the healthcare service providers have to conclude a contract with the Sun A Health Foundation. Uh, now about tax separation. Uh, this year, 627,000 income tax declarations were presented this year. 90% of them were e-declarations, and 80% of e-declarations were presented during the first week. So uh, about two weeks after uh, starting all the declarations, uh, people were starting to get information whether they can be uh, paid back uh, by the state or should they pay in addition. Then uh, people can uh, register the car uh, over the internet to have papers free motor vehicle or registration center. Uh, they can uh, uh, register to the driving license exams over the internet. Uh, all customers are asked to check their personal data online and uh, if there are notifications uh, from the center to the customer then it can be sent out by email and it's accessible 24 hours a day seven days a week 365 days a year e-banking 99 percent of transactions are made over the internet citizens, uh, citizens and also companies uh, all transactions over 200 euros must be signed digitally by means of ID card or uh, password calculator. And uh, all this uh, ID card validity, uh, not depending on the service, but uh, every service, when an ID card is used, the validity is checked online. So the service, checking service, so that service is always up and running. And this is provided by uh, Certification Center of Estonia. It's a private company, but it has contract with Arma. Uh, we have ID tickets. Uh, people buy, uh, buy regular bank automatic transfer or uh, just enter their uh, account in ID ticket uh, environment. Uh, buy a ticket over the internet and they don't need to have any paper uh, pieces of paper uh, with them when they are going to uh, ride the bus or a tram or a trolley bus. Uh, all the controls have a card reader which can be, uh, which then uh, ID card is inserted and uh, then they can check whether the uh, a uh, person has the right to ride or the validity of the ticket has already gone and uh, then uh, driving within the borders of Estonia we do not need to carry neither driver's license neither car insurance paper uh, nor car technical passport everything can be checked over the e-police network Every uh, police patrol car has a computer and um, uh, connection, telecommunication connection to uh, various databases via police headquarters. And uh, uh, presenting ID card, all information can be checked from there. Whether the insurance is valid and you have uh, just gone through your technical 
check of the car and so on. What we have found while uh, implementing and using the car, it's reasonable to set up only one commonly used good certificate authority trust chain. Uh, important questions before getting started. Is ID card compulsory or voluntary? Uh, should we create infrastructure or service? Both user and service provider must have the motivation and necessity to use digital signature. Time is most valuable project resource. Public procurement procedures may change totally all the project time table. So that's correct. Only simple systems work. Technology is not a project. People are. Driving force is often not in the top management of public institutions. Find this person who will uh, just uh, start to pull the, all these projects. Even bad publicity is also a PR campaign. Scandal is the mother of brand name. Everybody knows. Standard solutions give you at least predictable problems. Learn from others. But you can learn only from your own mistake. It takes years to reach wide implementation. We started in 97, now we have 2011. The investments today in the development of basic components will pay highly in tomorrow's single e service. But it will be clear only after several years, and this might not be the motivation for public then cost saving is usually a bad argument. And good enough is the key word. Let others do what they need. Cooperate with private sector. Because they start to use and uh, uh, give access to the service. Governmental uh, push politics uh, usually doesn't work. So we have seen Finland, uh, France has several attempts. then movement should be from the enterprise level to industry and state level. Movement should be from tailor-made solutions to the integrated e-environment. And two more. On Sunday, you mustn't forget that mercy. And on weekdays, do not forget about the laws of nature. So, that's all for now. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Jeremy, uh, if you stay on, we'll, we'll do a little bit of Q&A um, as we get to the end. Jeremy, can you do it? Sure. Sure. So uh, first of all, thanks, uh, thanks, Daniel. Thanks for uh, uh, ITIF for uh, continuing the leadership in the space. As Rob Atkinson mentioned, I've, I've been around quite a while. I actually showed up in 1997. Fresh out of college with a smart card in my pocket and ended up with a, a job with a job uh, uh, in the Senate working for a guy, uh, then Senator Chuck Robb, who was actually intent on um, getting that technology deployed across the Department of Defense and civilian agencies. And I've uh, I've been around the space in a few different capacities uh, since then. Uh, and then, as some of you know, ran away from it completely a couple of years ago, in large part frustrated by the fact that we weren't making much progress. Uh, as a country in actually developing or implementing a strong EID strategy and decided it was just time to do something else. Uh, and then I started drinking with the wrong people in the administration about a year ago, so you see how well that plan worked. Um, I, I think if there's one thing that, that the report really highlights that, that Daniel and ITIF have put out, uh, it's that other countries are moving forward, in many cases quite rapidly, uh, with uh, very well thought out EID strategies. And from a competitiveness issue, if we don't have our own here in the United States, we're going to rapidly uh, fall behind. Uh, the good news is uh, there is a strategy that's in place, and it's actually a pretty good one. And it's, I, I would say, very different from, from some of the efforts that we've seen in other places around the world um, in that it, it doesn't really focus on what would be a traditional national ID strategy. Uh, what, what's going on in Estonia is a fantastic reference implementation for the rest of the world. Um, I mean, here in, you know, uh, you know, the description of, of all the different ways that the card is being used today uh, and how it's really uh, improved, you know, citizen services as well as things in the private sector, uh, it's really fantastic. I, I think it's also, you know, 
clear, you know, to me as I'm listening to it and thinking, wow, this sounds great, and this just would not work in the United States. We've been through the national ID debate here several times. Uh, there are some things about the U.S. that's just fundamentally different from other countries, and I, I don't think that we're going to get too far um, going down that road again, although, you know, Lord knows there's certainly folks, you know, who will continue to try. Uh, so what actually helped persuade me to come back into government after all these years outside um, was the very thoughtful and different approach that was taken by President Obama and the, and the folks in the White House on, on putting together the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, or NSIC, which is a recognition that you're not going to have a, 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 an identity card uh, program, so why not take a step back and look at other ways that you can accomplish some of the objectives or, or achieve some of the benefits that you actually get from having uh, a national ID program uh, and, and, and look at ways that actually would fit into what is, you know, arguably a very uniquely American set of attitudes on um, what the role of the government is in, you know, issuing and managing identity and, and developing applications that will use it. Um, so the NSTIC, for, for those who don't know, there was a draft that was put out last year. It was signed in final form in April uh, by President Obama. Uh, it's gotten an extraordinary amount of White House attention um, since that time in terms of, you know, really good coordinated uh, focus across multiple parts of, of the White House and other parts of the administration uh, on actually seeing it implemented successfully. Um, I, I think it's the first time that, the, that a president's ever actually signed anything in the U.S., uh, let alone been aware of uh, a, uh, an EID strategy. Uh, they also have backed it up with money in terms of requesting $24.5 million for fiscal year 12. Uh, to both help uh, uh, NIST, uh, where I now work, stand up a national program office to lead the implementation of the strategy, uh, as well as fund um, a big range of pilots. Uh, pilots are going to be very important, I, I think, in terms of demonstrating that some of the concepts that are laid out in the strategy can actually work, as well as enticing different stakeholders, whether they be state governments, uh, private sector companies, uh, advocacy groups like the CDT. Uh, to all come to the table and actually work through some of the tough challenges that will lie ahead in creating the, the identity ecosystem that the end state calls for. Um, of course, we are in a challenging budget environment right now, uh, so we're waiting to see what happens uh, with the appropriation. Uh, I know that the Senate marked up uh, uh, their Commerce Department appropriations bill last night, and I haven't yet seen any, any details yet, uh, although a couple of people whispered some things yesterday that suggested there might be something positive to look forward to, but I honestly have no idea what those details are. So it's, uh, it's certainly something we're looking at, and also, frankly, considering what we'll do if, if we don't have funding to move forward uh, and how much can still be achieved. Um, in, in terms of, um, I guess it's probably good if I have the microphone on so some folks can hear me. Um, you know, what is NSIC trying to achieve? You know, there, there's really three things. Uh, the, the first is, as Daniel mentioned, you know, 18, it's been 18 years since the famous New Yorker cartoon was published, and today there's still no way to really ascertain with great certainty whether you're a dog on the Internet. Uh, now, we try to make clear uh, from the government side that there's plenty of situations where it's great to be a dog on the Internet, and we don't want to change that. If you're just, you know, surfing the web, uh, if you're leaving very thoughtful, uh, politely written comments at the end of a news article or somebody's blog, um, hey, you know, if you want to be anonymous or operating under a pseudonym, uh, there, there's really no reason to try and change that. And, in fact, I, I think there's a recognition that, that's, uh, uh, you know, mentioned several times in the actual NSTIC document. Uh, that the ability to be a dog on the internet is something that's actually helped to uh, catalyze its growth, and there are many, plenty of times that that should be perfectly fine. Uh, I think where it is an issue is when you talk about moving some interesting types of applications online that can't be done today because the risk model uh, that involves you know, the fact that there's a good probability that somebody is a dog on the internet simply precludes things from being moved online. Uh, so whether it's state governments who have you know love a ton of services that they'd love to get out of brick and mortar and make it available to citizens, uh, whether it's you know things like health IT where we want to be able to uh, have a robust system of electronic health records that can be exchanged and shot back and forth between providers and patients and hospitals and whatnot, um, or whether there's you know some other you know applications in the private sector uh, where you could do things online if you only had great certainty that you didn't have a dog at the other end of the transaction, uh, you really want to. Uh, come up with a strategy for uh, for solving that problem uh, to enable you know new types of businesses online and uh, you know perhaps change the model of what we do today with, with different kinds of transactions. Uh, I think the second issue that we also are trying to get at within the NSIC is that passwords are fundamentally broken and we need to get away from them. Uh, Verizon and the Secret Service do a report every year together 
uh, on data breaches. Uh, in the 2011 report, four of the top seven uh, methods of data breaches were tied one way or another to dependency on passwords. Um, it's a real problem with cybersecurity in that, you know, it is essentially, you know, I point out, you know, the username and password is arguably the only thing about my online experience that hasn't changed since I went on the internet 20 years ago. Uh, I think I was, I can't remember, 20 year reunions next year, I was in high school the first time I went on, and it was a green screen, you know, uh, terminal uh, over a 2400 baud modem. Um, you know, now I'm doing things, you know, with the Blackberry in my pocket, uh, but I'm still using the username and password to sign on. Uh, it's time for something different. Uh, it's a reason that this is an initiative that's being driven out of Howard Schmidt's office, who's the White House Cybersecurity Coordinator, is because there's a recognition that when you look at improving the cybersecurity posture of the country, our continued reliance on passwords and almost everything we do, not, not just in government, but also outside in the private sector, uh, makes us extremely vulnerable and is the root cause uh, or the root method used you know, for a lot of different attacks that have a real impact on our security uh, and our economic health. Uh, so getting people to stronger credentials, uh, whether they be you know, smart card certificates, one-time passwords, or things that we haven't even thought of yet, and there's some, some great innovation going on in the space, uh, really is, is necessary for both our economic security as well as improving our cybersecurity posture. Uh, and the third thing that, that does tie into it is, is NSIC, you know, is a broader part of the administration's effort uh, to improve the levels of, of privacy that we all enjoy online, uh, particularly focused around giving people more choices uh, in what information that they have to reveal uh, to engage in different transactions as well as better ways to protect that information as it goes forward. Uh, I think everybody in the room is, you know, used to going to a new online commerce site and being asked to fill in one or two pages of information, much of which isn't necessarily relevant to the transaction. Um, and oftentimes, you know, to get to, you know, some of the points that ITIF has raised about you, you don't want to take too much information out of the digital economy since that also enables, um, you know, certain benefits, you know, in terms of, you know, services that we get for in exchange for information. One of the problems today is a lot of the information that's out there isn't particularly accurate. Um, I've you know seen you know some studies which have said that of all the information that's bought, sold, and traded, 50% is incorrect, and nobody actually knows which 50% that is. So there's been you know some very interesting business models that have been put forward, and you know I'm seeing a couple venture-funded uh, startup companies who are you know basically trying to essentially embrace the concept that data is going to be bought and sold and traded, and you know, why not come up with a value proposition that for me as an individual, as a consumer, uh, I get a chance to better control that information and when it's released and how it's released and be monetized for that. And what's in it for the relying parties is to actually get information that's, you know, 90% accurate or 100% accurate rather than 50%. Um, it's a way that, you know, would return uh, more choice and control over data back to the individuals who, you know, arguably ought to be in control of it while also improving, um, the data that's out there and the way that it is, does flow in is exchanged in order to enable, you know, perhaps some better targeted services online that we've seen. So, the, you know, those are essentially the three issues that N6 is trying to solve. Uh, the way that we're doing it that I think is fundamentally different than what a lot, a lot of other national ID focus strategies have been is starting off with the assumption that the government is not going to be the de facto provider of, of uh, electronic identities. Uh, not that we don't uh, envision and actually hope that there will be uh, government entities at, at federal, state, and local levels who do step up to become identity providers. Uh, but what we're really looking at is, well, if the government's not going to be able to tackle this on its own, and, and you know, frankly, outside of some of the national ID battles we've been in, I think we're also in a place where it's going to be hard to afford uh, in this uh, environment uh, of fiscal austerity uh, to be actually starting up, a, 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 you know, and, and funding something that, that's much bigger than you know, simply trying to implement the strategy, which is you know where, where we're currently focused right now. Uh, these things can be expensive. So rather than you know, assume that the government has to be the only issuer that's out there, let's instead look to establish an identity ecosystem where you can have multiple providers. It could be a private sector company who can get uh, their solutions accredited um, and, you know, in line with NSTIC. It could be a nonprofit like the CDT, who is a group who advocates for, for privacy and more control online, might choose to actually offer something as a value add uh, to um, you know, their followers and their membership. Uh, and it could be a government, it could be a state DMV, it could certainly be the State Department who today is, you know, probably the most commonly, um, you know, recognized issuer of a, of a federal credential, the passport or the passport card at the federal level. Uh, but let's not assume that it all has to be government issued. Uh, we can accredit uh, third party providers and we're, in fact we're doing it today and have been for a couple years uh, through the work that Deb Gallagher and her team are leading over at GSA uh, uh, around federal identity credential and access management. So. Um, 
actually, you know, getting to that, it, it's worth noting a little bit. I, I noticed the chart that Daniel had, you know, showing that we've had no use and no deployment. We are in the uh, the loser quadrant, I guess, it, it, as uh, uh, some might call it, uh, in terms of EID. Uh, I, I will say there's actually some good progress that's being made in terms of, you know, three trust framework providers certified through GSA the last few years. You've had Kantara, OpenID, uh, and InCommon, which is a federation of research universities. Uh, there's a couple more in the queue focused on higher level of assurance credentials. Uh, I'm pretty comfortable in saying that I think by the end of the year you will have at least two and possibly three or four uh, 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 credential providers actually certified at uh, level of assurance three in accordance with uh, the NIST standards. Uh, if, you, if you follow, you know, four levels of assurance uh, uh, that are prescribed by NIST uh, Special Pub 863, uh, which basically gets you into something that's a little more interesting than, you know, leveraging, you know, say a PayPal or a Google username and password instead of uh, one that's created in an agency, which I think is where you, you, you've seen some of the early implementations. You know, how can you actually bring in credentials with a higher level of security, some real identity pr uh, proofing behind them so that you know the person at the other end isn't a dog, uh, and some real security behind them? Uh, and I will also say that the, as somebody who's been around the space close to 15 years now, the level of energy right now in a number of agencies in terms of bringing some high-profile apps online that would leverage these new LOA3-approved credentials is... Um, it's pretty darn exciting. I've had a couple people, you know, who have been in the space say to me they, they've seen more energy and, and ideas put out the last two months than they've seen in the last 10 years. And, and so I do think that uh, the government is going to be able to, you know, in the next six to 12 months, uh, demonstrate some real progress in um, in this area that it has, you know, been elusive in the past. Uh, one of the reasons that that we're pushing so much on it, one reason I'm spending a lot of my time on it, and and, and the White House. Uh, is, is doing so as well as it's really recognized within the end stick that we need to be an early adopter in the government that this is going to work. There's, um, it's really great to write a white paper about how this can work conceptually, but there's a chicken and egg problem uh, as well as a, uh, I think what a former client described to me is the who wants to be the lead zebra problem. The zebra at the front of the pack tends to be the one that gets eaten by the lions. So if uh, we're you know asking uh, businesses uh, outside of government to be uh, agreeing to rely upon uh, this, this new class of electronic identities, um, they might not want to be the lead zebra in the pack. Uh, so it's good if the government can do so and actually show that we can trust these and they're secure and they're reliable and there are models in place that can then be replicated in the private sector. Uh, we, we think by the government being an early adopter, we'll have a much easier time driving private sector adoption. So. Um, you know, let me just you know sort of wrap up and say you know where we are focused with NSTIC right now. Uh, I mentioned earlier one of the things that's, that that things that that, that is uh, unique about NSTIC is does not assume that the government has to be the only issuer of identity uh, uh, credentials. Um, you know, NSTIC is even more explicit in saying this needs to be private sector led. Uh, we believe that the private sector is in the best position uh, one to identify the barriers that have really precluded adoption of strong EID applications in the U.S. Two, they're probably in a better uh, position than, than us uh, pointy head folks in the government in terms of identifying what the right kinds of technologies are that ought to be used in you know, the next generation of electronic ID. Uh, there is a ton of innovation going on in the space. We're also witnessing a, a rapid evolution in the computing environments that we're all on, uh, where it's not just desktop and laptops anymore, it's tablets, it's smartphones, and a whole other range of, of, of really cool devices. Uh, that don't necessarily have an easy place to insert the smart card uh, that we've all been, you know, looking at the last, you know, you know, 10, 15 years. At least not a smart card that's in the same form factor. Uh, there's some really cool stuff going on right now in terms of, well, how can you shrink the functionality of the PIV card that I carry in my pocket into something that would fit into the micro SD chip uh, and still have plenty of memory left, you know, over for, for videos and pictures and bootleg music um, or legally downloaded music. <laughs> so... Um, I, I think there's a lot of innovation that's going on right now, but again, if the government tries to look ahead to where mobile computing is going to be in three to five years and, and specify what technologies ought to be used, uh, we'll probably not get it right. So let's let the private sector lead there. Um, and so, you know, part of that is, well, if the private sector is going to be in the lead, how do they actually organize to develop, you know, all of the ground rules of the instinct? I mean, what do we need to get? We need technology standards for interoperability. Uh, we need operating rules to determine, you know, how uh, uh, transactions will, will, will take place in an, ordinary ma in a, in an orderly manner to uh, make sure that, you know, there's some uh, regular policies and procedures that govern what happens at every step of the way. Uh, we need an accreditation process 
Uh, these are all things that the NSTIC actually looks to a steering body of private sector stakeholders uh, to take the lead on. And so we've been spending a lot of time the last couple months uh, working on actually establishing that steering body. We closed a notice of inquiry in July that we got 57 responses to, and we're digesting that right now. I think we've got a pretty good idea where we're going, um, but I got to get some things cleared through lawyers and the interagency review process before we can actually uh, put something out that, that's going to be in paper form. Um, it's government can move a little slow sometimes when it comes to these things. Uh, beyond that, we're focused on pilots, both, uh, you know, I, I, I've been joking since we don't have funds yet in FY11, but we have other agencies that do have real needs of, of you know, apps that they want to move online uh, quickly and they need to solve their identity challenges beforehand. I'm, I'm really trying to help them spend their money on, on our behalf uh, to demonstrate, you know, some early wins in the government space. And we're also looking ahead to assuming that we get some pilot money next year, as it was proposed in the president's budget. Uh, how can we get a, uh, a grant process started very early before the dollars are actually in hand? Uh, this is assuming, of course, that Congress doesn't pass a budget by the end of the month. Uh, if they do, then they'll beat me to it. But uh, that we could actually get pilots awarded very quickly next year. So uh, really, I would, I would say, uh, you know, formation of the steering body and, and, and getting those activities kicked off along with pilots is where we're heavily focused uh, for the next year. And um, I'm, if you can't tell, I'm kind of excited about the strategy. I, I think it's very well written. I had nothing to do with putting it together, but I'm glad I got hired to help implement it. Uh, and I do think it is going to be uh, the path forward to, uh, at a minimum, it will be a uniquely American strategy for accelerating the deployment and use of EID, uh, but also may, uh, certainly from some of the calls we've gotten from other countries who are out there who are finding it very interesting that we're proposing to rely on the private sector rather than have a government-issued ID it may actually be a template for what some of the next generation of EID programs are around the world. So um, with that, I'll stop talking and move on to Aaron. Great. Unless you have questions. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, why don't we have Aaron, uh, why don't you give, uh, give your reaction, and then we'll, we'll open up the Q&A. Um, Jeremy sure. Messages asked, uh, have you changed your password in the past four years? I have, actually. <laughs> At least that part's changed. Yeah. In fact, embarrassingly, my Hotmail was uh, hacked uh, last week. Oh, no. <laughs> so I'll be, I'll be pretty brief here. I just want to offer some reactions. My name's Aaron. I work with the Center for Democracy and Technology. Our tagline is keeping the internet open, innovative, and free. Uh, we do a lot of work with consumer privacy, freedom of speech online, and a number of other areas. So identity is an interesting confluence because it affects all of these things. So I want to just give a brief reaction to NSTIC from our perspective, uh, highlight some of the challenges and perception problems that the project might face, um, talk just for one or two minutes about privacy, and then kind of wrap up here. As Jeremy said, NSTIC is really a uniquely American solution to the EID thing. Basically, it says the government's going to be a convener and a corraller and an enabler, and the private sector is going to create and maintain IDs that protect our privacy, give us choice, boost commerce, and make our life more convenient. It's a, it's a tall order. That said, I think NSTIC gets it largely right. It's a very ambitious vision. It's a long-term vision. It promises to jump a lot of hoops, but it's good to set the bar high. And CDT has been largely supportive of the NSTIC strategy, and Jeremy and his team deserve a lot of credit for um, setting the right foundation. There are a lot of challenges here. As Jeremy mentioned, we've been through the real ID and national ID card debate numerous times. Um, as NSTIC was coming together and I was talking to reporters who would call to ask about it, almost without exception, their first question would be, how worried should we be? Is the government going to make a driver's license for the internet? Is this a new national ID card? You know, I don't think people want an internet ID card from the government. And time after time after time, I tried to counter with a nuanced explanation of what NSIC is really trying to do. But the bottom line is it's a hard sell, I think, to a lot of the populace that an internet ID can somehow be empowering and can somehow make your life better. It's a hard sell. I, I, I hear Estonia talk about how they started their program in 1997. And in some ways, I think that might have actually been an advantage. Um, another challenge NSTIC faces is, to a lot of people, there's a lack of apparent need. I've had people come to me and reporters come to me and con people from Congress say to me, I don't really get the problem this is trying to solve. We have Facebook, we have Twitter, I'm on my online banking site, I can go to Amazon, I can do all these great things on my internet, I can pay my taxes through Quicken or TaxSlayer or another service, and my browser remembers all my usernames and passwords, I don't quite understand why we need this, this ID thing. And 
it's true to some level. I mean, to a consumer who's looking at their life on the internet, things work pretty darn well most of the time, except for those people that have security problems. And yes, usernames and passwords are bad, but again, we have risk management models and a lot of things function very well on the internet today. Um, so there's a great need, I think, to make more apparent and more clear both to the general public and to Congress that controls the funds the benefits that this will unlock. I think those areas might be the EREC, we're moving all our health records online, that's going to need a good identity management system. As was said before, state DMVs are locked in brick and mortar. Um, there's a lot of, especially on the state and local government letter, levels, things that could be unlocked by these systems. But the challenge here is that we have an amazing array of services online that function pretty well in the eyes of a lot of people. And in some ways that's a detriment when you're trying to build a more secure, more interoperable, more consistent system. Um, that's a disadvantage and it's, it's tough. There, I, there hasn't, I haven't seen a killer app yet. The, the one argument where I can go home to my parents at Christmas and say, this is why you need to get excited about an EID system or NSTEC, it's tough. And while ultimately consumers may not be the audience and the people that need to be convinced, some work needs to be done on building the positive case for this so it's something people can get excited about and want to put time and effort and money towards implementing. As Dan said at the beginning, another great and interesting part of this is that a national EID system like Envision by NSTIC can really do a lot of great things for privacy. Your liquor store example is, is spot on. Why should I have to show my picture, give my address, my blood type, my height, my weight? But I can see that. But um, this new system can actually enable privacy enhancing technologies in a way that you can reveal only minimally what you need to for every transaction. Um, you can do unlinkability so my identity provider doesn't know I've used service A and service B with their card. Uh, there's a great potential here to both preserve the existing protections of the real world ID systems we have and enhance them and that's all good stuff. Um, there's some suspicion and some reason to be careful here in that if we eventually arrive in a world of fewer identity providers, those identity providers have a potentially very broad view into our online transaction, uh, transactions and activities. So that's where we need to, to have these multi-stakeholder meetings and figure out what the standards are so we have a system that can be trusted by people and that will be viewed as fair by people. But that's all part of the process. And NSTIC rightly says we need a public-private partnership. We need a diverse set of stakeholders at the table to make this really happen. Nothing is going to get adoption if it's not trusted and transparent. So NSTIC sets the table correctly. Um, we're, we're set to have a great conversation here. And as Dan said, we certainly shouldn't expect that everything is going to be anonymous and that every transaction is going to have a minimal amount of data, especially in fields like healthcare, data is very, very valuable. <laughs> and eliminating that would have negative consequences. So there's definitely a balance here between what do we need to ensure people that their privacy is protected and they can trust a service, but not strip away data that's both commercially viable and might support the system and economically valuable. So this is, a, just to wrap up here, this is a, a big, tough project. We need to thread a lot of needles to do this right. Um, NSTIC's a fantastic vision. It's an ambitious vision. It's a long-term vision. And we've got a lot of work to do to make that happen. And as my boss said, at the NSTIC rollout, it's going to be a lot of cat herding. <laughs> um, Her specific advice to me was get a big spray bottle and a really big battle cat in it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's going to be a tough process, and it, it's yet to be seen whether the you know ambitious, uniquely American approach to this is going to work out. Um, but I think that Obama's signature on a strategy that lays out the right principles and right values is a is a good starting place. Thanks, thanks, Aaron. And um, I just would like to open it up if anyone has questions uh, for one of the panel or or Ella oh, back here. So, uh, Jim Snyder from I. Solon in the Harvard Software Center. I have a little problem with the, the framing of the paper, and actually today is the bad electronic IDs. Why is the U.S. so far behind? And explaining international leadership, electronic identification systems. Maybe it would be modified if you talk about national electronic IDs as opposed to electronic IDs. I don't think America is behind in, in technology. I also, you say we have zero deployment in the United States compared to Estonia. I think we have more deployment of national IDs in the United States and in Estonia. The Department of Homeland Security now has, I mean, I think you, one, of, one of you acknowledged how for intergovernmental purposes we have ID systems. There's more than a million individuals. The Defense Department has sophisticated 
ID. So in terms of numbers, maybe not proportion and the types of applications you're talking about, we have uh, very significant deployment and very sophisticated technology. So on the technology front also, I haven't read your report, I just looked at the executive summary. I was rather surprised that there's no mention of UCore, which is um, the universal core of NEEM, which ha incorporates uh, a very sophisticated ID system as well as some other very valuable attributes that I think should be thought of when we talk about IDs, a definition of when and where associated uh, with documents as well as who. And uh, so that is, you know, the a national ID for, for intra-governmental use, I would say, with huge deployments uh, and very sophisticated with many biometric identifiers and, and other types of identifiers. So I didn't, I didn't see any mention of that. That's an important technology as long with NISTIC, it, it, it seems to me. And then also just as a curiosity, India has gotten so much publicity and is such an ambitious rollout of uh, you know, 600 million people with national IDs in the next you know, few years, that, uh, I thought it was surprising that that wasn't a... Uh, sure, yeah. You know, I, I think if you look at the report, um, what we've done is we have tried to scope it very specifically about what we wanted to look at in this report. And, you know, and, you know we say in there very clearly, we are not looking at um, you know, government-only systems. We are looking at national level in the sense of available to all citizen systems. Uh, we specifically exclude that and, you know, acknowledge that there, there's this, you know, some acknowledgement in the U.S. section because obviously we don't have the national system of some of the things that are going on. Uh, but that's not what we looked at in other countries and, and so that's not what we focused on in the U.S. as well. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so to that point, that's, you know, that, that's really why we did that for, um, in regards to India and similarly with China, uh, they aren't using those systems for an identity that you would authenticate as an individual to an online system to prove your identity, right? It's been used to identify individuals. It's been used to associate with government benefits. So um, we mentioned it and we mentioned why we don't talk about it. And I think there is a distinction. And, you know, to some people that distinction may not matter. Um, in this report, we just want to make that clear because I think what we're trying to do in the U.S. is, is different. We are trying to build something bigger, and, and that's why we focus from that perspective. But right here, and then. Um, this sounds simplistic, but um, it's picked up a little bit but what, by what Heller said. It, a lot of times, terminology makes the difference, and um, identity itself, the word E-I-D itself, is enough to send people in the wrong direction. So uh, Heller mentioned something called an E-key. Why not call it an E-key system? Why not talk to people about the benefits of having an E-key? Um, sometimes terminology makes just all the difference. Jeremy, do you have a thought on terminology? There are a number of people who suggested that NSTIC is not the catchiest name. Uh, now that the strategy has been published for the initiative going forward. So uh, I, I welcome all good suggestions. Thanks, Danny. Um, just real quick. Uh, if you could say your, two, your name. Two points. My name is Heather Gonzalez. I'm with CRS. On page 52, I think you have a typo. Um, <laughs> you call the data policy office at the Department of Commerce that you're proposing, and then in the rest of the paragraph, you call it the data privacy office. And those are two, those could be different things. So I don't know what you intend there. Um, the second thing is, in the category of impacts, one of the concerns that has been raised about our existing system with to the extent that private companies have personal data is concern about the relationship between those companies and the judicial system with respect to um, two things. One, impact of that information on the judicial system itself, e-discovery, for example. And then the second is the impact um, putting private companies in a position where they're having to negotiate with government over civil liberties. And there have been concerns that some companies have raised about being in that position. And so I wondered if the report addresses sort of how this system is expected to engage or, or interface with the judicial system itself, and then 
with regard to these companies mediating civil liberties? Are you asking in our report in this? I'll certainly first. tackle it from the NSTIC perspective in that one of the one of the questions I've been asked several times is, you know, NSIC says, okay, so we'll have these approved private sector credential providers, but they only get approved and get the government's blessing if they adhere to a whole bunch of privacy protections that are laid out in here. And, you know, most folks in the advocacy community say, that's actually pretty cool that that would be uh, uh, the baseline. However, people, some then ask the question, all that aside, the courts have already held that personal information that's held by third party providers can be obtained by the government under certain circumstances. What is NSIC going to do about that? And my general answer to them is that's a debate that's been raging for years that's much, much bigger than just this initiative. And the answer is there's nothing within NSTIC that's going to change all that. So if that is the case, but there's still good privacy protections built in, to advocates, how do you feel about that? I agree with Jeremy. I think that NSTIC has done almost all it, all it can in its own role by putting in the Fair Information Practice Principles and saying anyone that's going to do this needs to abide by those. I would argue from the perspective of CDT that a program like NSTIC is ultimately going to need to be supported by a reform of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. If we're going to put in, if we're going to go toward a world of more highly identified internet identifiers, that's all the more <laughs> pressure on fixing the government access problem online. It's all the more pressure for getting baseline privacy legislation. Um, so I think it would be great for NSTIC to ultimately be supported by those sorts of legal reforms, which we're arguing for regardless. But NSTIC itself can't fix those issues, but it could certainly be supported by reforms in those areas. And one of the things that the NSTIC does call out is, you know, both the government as well as the private sector steering group need to identify if there are areas where new legislation or regulation is going to be necessary to provide a better policy underpinning for the identity ecosystem that we seek to create. Uh, so that, that certainly called for, you know, this is something that's an administration initiative along with the Privacy Bill of Rights that they've called for. Um, you know, the flip side is, and I, I point this out at times, any any strategy who, where successful implementation depends on, we'll do this and we'll do that, and then Congress will pass a law um, in, in this legislative environment is one that we do need to think deeply about um, because that's not always something that's going to be um, a given. So we're also you know, actually really looking hard at, uh, as we look at you know, some of the issues, whether it's privacy or whether it's how do you handle uh, allocation of liability in these transactions for when something goes wrong, uh, are there ways that you can build some protections into, say, uh, the contracts that will govern the use of, of, of identity providers in the identity ecosystem, uh, rather than count on Congress to take action on something that um, they may simply choose not to do? And one thing we, we, we do talk about in the report, um, in addition to the, the liability issue, um, is the fact that, you know, at some point we, we may need to be considering federal um, legislation to make sure to preempt um, state legislation, because you do see states already beginning to take some action um, in this area in terms of defining liability or defining other um, types of access issues, and, and you do want to have a baseline. We, we are talking about, hopefully, what will be a, a national system and, and national um, you know, expectations. Uh, to address the, the other issue, the Data Privacy versus Data Policy Office, I believe what that's referring to is um, we have a recommendation in, their, uh, in, in this report that we've talked about um, in other reports in regards to privacy, where specifically with the Department of Commerce um, and its you know, kind of general mission to promote commerce in the United States, that what's been proposed in the past by the NTIA's uh, Green Paper on, on Privacy was a data privacy office. And uh, what we've said is that you know, the Department of Commerce needs to be concerned with more than just privacy, it needs to be concerned with data policy in general. Um, so protecting privacy, but also enabling all these beneficial uh, uses of information. So looking at things like cross-border data flows, looking at things like how do you successfully anonymize data, um, looking at issues with liability or other types of restrictions on the use of data, and that that's the type of framework we want policymakers, at least in the Department of Commerce, to take. You know, it might be the FTC. You know, they have the you know privacy division, and that that's all they focus on. But something like Commerce needs to have a, a bigger picture, and of course with NIST as part of Commerce. Um, I think that it's a very appropriate. Great, I think we'll do one more. Hey, um, Dan, I, I was reading through uh, technology issues about smart cards. Um, 
one of the um, barriers, if you will, would be the cost to the readers. You, you list that the average price is less than $50. In volumes, it's closer to 10. Mm -hmm. um, so that should be really clarified because people will see $50 and that's a big red flag. 10 is a lot more affordable to, I think, the average consumer. Um, the other thing is that software must be available for multiple operating systems. That's for any software application. It's not just an AID program. I mean, Quicken's got to do that for their software. It has to be available on different operating systems. So right. I don't but, see that as really being an issue. Right. Both of those were, um, we have in the, in the report that probably wasn't illustrated here. In the report, we talk about all the different types of issues that lots of countries look at. Um, one of the issues um, that was, of course, cost of adoption for individuals, for card readers over time, the cost has shifted. Um, the cost that we have in there uh, should be a range. If it's not, that, that is a mistake. It, it just uh, says less than 50 Less than 50 dollars. So, I mean, I, I believe when we did that, we, we actually looked online to see what a couple of retailers were selling. Absolutely, it, it can be lower. I think we point out, for example, in Estonia, it is around $10 or 10 right. euros. Um, and, and those costs <laughs> fluctuate based on the government policies around it and how it's deployed. Um, so is it packaged? Is it sold at cost? Some places are selling things at cost, providing the cards at cost. The issue with um, system op interoperability, you know, operating system interoperability was an issue um, and was something that specifically a, a few countries dealt with where, you know, they roll it out and it's just for Windows or it's just for a version of Windows or they had issues where people can actually install the driver for card readers. Um, and, and those were barriers. And, and that's something, you know, the, the policymakers need to be aware of. It's certainly things that going forward, there's no reason why it should be a barrier. I, I agree with that, absolutely. So, thank you. Well, I, I appreciate it. Um, sorry about the time, but, you know, we'll, we'll stick around if there's any other questions. Appreciate everyone coming out. And uh, I appreciate our panelists and Heller. If uh, you have any uh, closing thoughts for us, I just want to give you one more opportunity. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks, everyone.